Welcome to See You on the Other Side, where the world of the mysterious collides with the world of entertainment. A discussion of art, music, movies, spirituality, the weird, and self-discovery. And now, your hosts, musicians and entertainers who have their own weakness for the weird, Mike and Wendy from the band Sunspot. Boo! 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 No, no, Wendy, I'm booing for two reasons. Okay. <laughs> what are those reasons? I'm booing because <laughs> Halloween season has ended. Oh, so I now, know. now the rest of the straights go back to being boring and thinking about the next holiday. What are we going to do? I don't know. We're going to have to extend Halloween all year, like the night okay. before Christmas. I'm in for that. I did. Number two is that we played a thing called Boo Fest on Friday, <laughs> where the idea was to get heckled by the audience. So that the more they yes. liked you, the, the the worst things they said about you. Yeah. It was like a smack talk fest, it, too. It was like a smack talk. And the funny thing is, like, my parents didn't really get it. So my mother but watched, like, a live <laughs> video on Facebook of it. And she's like, well, it looks like you had fun. A lot of dirty language, though. Oh, no. <laughs> they always, they're all, you know, they're always like, yes, oh, mother. Oh, no. Like, it's... Right, it was meant for the, it's, it's not, you know, like a televised event. It's just funny. <laughs> you know, it's always, because you and old people are on Facebook and old people are always looking at things. You know, they're always like, oh, what are we doing? Because they're home on a Friday night or whatever. And they watch you. Like, they're like, oh, I wonder what my son's doing. And my son is hurling vulgarities in an audience. Yeah, and I mean, thankfully, there's cameras everywhere following you around and <laughs> <laughs> documenting right. your every move and every word. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, I, All anyway. those smartphones. Boo Fest was a great time, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to be running for political office anytime soon, so I'm not worried <laughs> about him. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. We played. Uh, there's another a band that you guys might like on there uh, called Dr. Noise, and they sing a lot of geek songs to everything from songs about Dr. Who to like there's some Alice in Wonderland inspired tracks and things like that. So I think you guys yeah. like that band. And their latest album has a cover of a Sunspot song on it. So oh, that's, that's right. pretty sweet. Their album Shadows has a cover <laughs> of our song Arthuriana. <laughs> And yes. another band we played was called Droids Attack. They used to have like a fake robot. Like, they remember the guy in the robot suit that used yes. to walk around and like strangle people in the audience? Yeah, so the I didn't see him at the yeah, show. The robot guy wasn't there, but they released a beer and shot a video and uh, had a really good time. So those are very, um, well, friendly bands to our kind of music. So we always recommend checking them out. Those were the local bands. And then there was a band from Minneapolis, United Teachers of Music. Yeah, and they were good. They rocked. So yeah, good time. Very fun, a little bit uh, trying on the self-esteem, you know, yeah. hearing everybody booing constantly. Like booing, like <laughs> like throwing onions at us, and rotten <laughs> vegetables. I wept like three times, but after I, afterwards, I felt pretty good about the whole affair. I did too. Because the thing blast. is, we got we got to take our aggression out on the next band. Like so, whatever. That's true. So whatever people said to us, I'm like, oh no, I, I just get to do it to the next. And usually, you don't get to like say horrible things about the bands after you, even if they're no, horrible. no. But this time the bands were good. We got to say horrible things about them, so it's like right. a double whammy <laughs> of entertainment. Yes, yes, exactly. So uh, anyway, we're definitely going to keep the Halloween spirit alive. Wendy, I saw that the Christmas tree was already up at the mall yesterday. No. Yeah. Yeah. So the Christmas season has well, begun. So we're yes. gonna have. To, Put little skulls on the Christmas tree or just sneak around. Just keep it rolling so that things don't just start getting too magical and happy yet. We want to keep yeah, them a little hey, evil for a bit. Don't forget, there is still a lot of clearance Halloween stuff out there. I picked up some candy corn just the oh, other day, half off. So, And it should be going even cheaper soon. So, I'm, you know, decorations and that kind of stuff, there's a little bit left. So get out there and get it and save it up for next time. That's right. Or just eat the candy. Just <laughs> right. go and get the candy. Oh, yeah. The candy you got to eat. Right, because chalk, it takes a good like six to nine months for chocolate to go bad. Just the tip. <laughs> um, and I'll still eat it when it's bad. And it's not just bad, it's just chalky. Okay, right. nobody, nobody cares about our chocolate chocolate. No. Uh, what they really want to hear about are weird things going on in Zanzibar. Oh, Zanzibar. That's right. And so the guest this week is Dr. Martin Walsh. And we've had him on the show before because he is an, I don't know, I don't, he would say that he's not an expert. I think he's an expert on Zanzibar and social phenomena. Yeah. And he's a, fascinating character who studied there, worked with the culture, lived in that area for a long time. And well, I find it particularly fascinating because I just know very little about that culture, you know? Yeah, same and, here. And I'll, I'll be the first to say that I have a very stereotypical, he'll talk about Africa, I have a very stereotypical idea of what it is. You know, I'm always picturing it, it like the Congo or the Savannah oh, or, sure. or things like that. And I mean, Zanzibar is, it is an island off of Tanzania, 
or Tanzania. I'm sorry, Tanzania makes it sound like it's a crazy Mania. place. Like, oh man, we're gonna go party in Tanzania. It's gonna be wild. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you can have a wild party in Tanzania. But so because we're uh, audio and not video, so if you're if you're picturing Africa, think about the right side of Africa. All right, or the east side. The east side of Africa. So there's Egypt next to Saudi Arabia, coming down. The Sudan's next to Saudi Arabia. Ethiopia is like right under Saudi Arabia. The corner is Somalia. Now, you probably have met some people who fought in Somalia or served in Somalia. I know I have uh, a bunch of people I know who have. And then when you're going down the coast from Somalia, you go into Kenya, and then there's uh, Tanzania right there. And so Tanzania is like halfway through Africa on the east side, and Zanzibar is a little island off it. And so it's, it's a fascinating place because it's just got a real interesting confluence of cultures. And that's what we did talk to, uh, to Dr. Walsh about. Now, last time we talked about this this spirit that people thought was uh, infecting people, you know, the, the Popobawa yeah. in the mid-1990s, the Popobawa. And yes. today we're talking about a species of leopard that actually went extinct in Tanzania because the, the Zanzibar leopard, because they thought it was a witch's familiar. And so the government was actually handing out guns for people to take out this leopard because it was a like a kept, they thought it was a kept animal by local wow. witches. Yeah. And this Can you is, imagine that? No, I mean, we have, I mean, I guess we have the same kind of thing with chronic wasting disease or whatever, you know, because people That's think a like, good point. That's a, yeah. Like the, like the state will give extra deer licenses to kill deer with chronic wasting disease. Yeah. But the deer, I mean, have nothing to do with witches. Right. At least from, <laughs> exactly. from what I think. We don't have, I mean... I think I I know most of the witches in Wisconsin because I've dated them. Oh, but, hey. man. All right. No, <laughs> but they had nothing to do with deer. Anyway, so that's the conversation with Martin today. Allison uh, from Milwaukee Ghost joins us, and we go in depth on the Zanzibar leopard. Martin Walsh is a social anthropologist with a PhD from the University of Cambridge. He has extensive field experience in East Africa, including the Tanzanian archipelago of Zanzibar. We've already had Martin on to discuss the mysterious Popabawa creature, and today we're going to talk more about paranormal beliefs in Zanzibar. Thank you for joining us today, Martin. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. It's a pleasure to uh, talk to you again. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, well, it's great to have you on. Yeah, today we just kind of want to see what you've been up to, and we want to discuss this fascinating, uh, like, cryptid, but who used to exist, known as the Zanzibar leopard. Now, to catch people up a little bit who may be not as familiar with the geography of East Africa, can you give us a quick lowdown of where Zanzibar is? Yeah, Zanzibar is, well, Zanzibar refers to, to three things. It refers to an archipelago. It refers to uh, one of the islands, which is also called Unguja, the main island. And it also refers to the main town, the sort of capital town, if you like, of Zanzibar. It's a kind of semi-autonomous part of Tanzania. Um, so it's offshore of Tanzania. It takes um, an hour or so to sort of sail there in a fast boat. And um, it's quite the main island, Unguja, Zanzibar Island. is. Uh, it's not very large. You can sort of cross it in an hour or, or go lengthways in maybe a bit more of an hour, um, given the sort of roughness of some of the roads. It's... Um, it's about 1,600 square kilometers in size, and it's uh, it's in the tropics, so it's 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 just six degrees south of the equator. So it's a pretty pretty warm climate, and there's a couple of rainy seasons. Population is quite high; it's quite densely populated. There's uh, more than half a million people on the main island, um, which, as I say, you know, has the sort of city of Zanzibar as, as locally referred to as a town, the town. Of, and it's a nice place. It's a tourist destination. A lot of uh, a lot of tourists go there these days It's um, uh, or use it as a stepping off point to um, go on wildlife safaris on the uh, African continent. And it's also a unique place as far as culture is concerned, right? So, I mean, I, I think a lot of Americans, me, a lot of our listeners, you know, you just think of Africa as this place and you just think of the culture or, you know, we have a very, let's say, limited view of Africa. Or at least I do. Um, I didn't learn that much. So when you think about the Zanzibar culture, it's unique because it, it's a combination of several cultures. Is that right? Um, in a sense, it, 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 it's it's um, it's, a, it's the it's a Swahili. It's Swahili speaking. 
Um, Swahili itself is a common name for a sort of culture that spreads right down uh, the East African coast from uh, from way up in Somalia down into Mozambique and onto those offshore islands. So it includes parts of the, you know, all of the Kenya coast and the uh, Tanzanian coast as well. Um, it's it's a distinctive culture in the sense that it, it, it's deeply African, it's Bantu African. Those are its roots. The, the language is also a, a Bantu um, African language. But because of that location on the sort of seaboard and islands, it's also interacted I mean, part of the whole sort of Indian Ocean world and the world of the Indian Ocean Rim. So there are a lot of transoceanic connections, uh, which include... Um, religion. It's a deeply um, Islamic culture, um, and it's had a lot of cultural influences, uh, historical influences over time from different parts of the Indian Ocean, from India, from the Arabian Peninsula, even from Southeast Asia and Indonesia, um, as well as the later experience of um, of uh, colonialism, of course. So, so I think if a lot of us would not, um, or a lot of listeners, or myself, uh, might not realize that here you have an East African country that's deeply Islamic. Like a lot, of, uh, we just you know we always think about the uh, you know Islam just being oh it's a Middle Eastern kind of thing and don't realize the, the reach of that particular culture and and putting that together where you take like okay it's a Swahili culture with Islamic and religion and that seems to me unique in itself. Yeah, it, it, it is in a way. It makes it special. But there are a lot of other African countries that um, are Islamic or partly Islamic. Um, both Tanzania and Kenya, a proportion of their populations are Islamic. Somalia is almost wholly Islamic. A um, number of West African and, and countries in the Sahel, the, the, the zone around the Sahara and north of that, are Islamic. So it's, um, yeah, it's it's a historical phenomenon. Um, and each place is different. And, uh, you know, as we say, Zanzibar has some quite distinctive features, but it also is part of that wider Islamic world and has those sort of historical um, connections that link it up to uh, uh, other Islamic countries and traditions. Now, to give people a little bit of political context, especially when we're talking about the, the Zanzibar leopard in a little bit, uh, when you mentioned that it had some colonization, what's the history of colonization in Zanzibar? I mean, that I, obviously that's probably a huge question. <laughs> so let's just get let's let's get the elevator speech. Well, yeah, yeah, about, like like who colonized? Who colonized Zanzibar? Who colonized it? Um, who came from afar? I guess um, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there, there have been a lot of interconnections over time with the um, with the Arabian Gulf and the, and the, the, and and then particularly with Oman. But the the first sort of uh, true colonists, if you like, that that we know of and think of in those terms, uh, were the Portuguese, um, and uh, uh, you know who who, who came this way. Um, yeah, at the end of the Middle Ages, I guess, and the start of the, the, the modern era when they were sort of fanning out across the Indian Ocean in search of uh, spices and the spice trade, as well as various other economic goods. Um, so that's, that's, that's uh, you know, that's quite early. That's 500 or so years ago. They didn't hang around for long and they didn't do very much in, uh, Zan didn't leave much of a record in Zanzibar itself. They did on other parts of the East African coast, but they were they were kicked out with the help of, um, if you like, a Arabs from Oman, and there've been a long uh, set of interactions between the East African coast and the cultures of, of Arabia and the Arabian Gulf and, and that area. So, with the assistance of uh, forces from Oman, um, the Portuguese were, were ejected from that area. And then for a long period, there was um, interactions with, with, with that part of the world. And that sort of deepened, if you like, the uh, East Africa, parts of the coast of Swahili culture were already Islamic by this stage. But that deepened the connections. It deepened the linguistic influence. And in the early uh, 19th century, the... the um, the Omani royal family, a branch of it, uh, came to uh, live in, in on the East African coast and, and came to rule over Zanzibar. So a lot of people migrated from Oman and other parts of uh, of the Middle East at that time to live in, uh, in Zanzibar. And, and why wouldn't they, right? Because it's only six, you said six degrees south of the equator. I would move to Zanzibar. <laughs> in a minute. 
<laughs> well, not just that, but um, yeah, there are a lot of uh, you know interesting resources in that part of the world that they don't have in Arabia, um, and vice versa. So, um, you know, I guess I guess kind of culture and religion flowed one way, and um, economic goods uh, tended to flow the other way, including, unfortunately, slaves um, over a you know for, for that uh, over a period of time. And the British came into the picture really in the 19th century. And uh, towards the end of the 19th century, um, as well as um, <clears throat> at least they would claim that they did this, suppressing the, the slave trade at that time, they also established a protectorate in Zanzibar. And um, they, they maintained the, um, if you like, the Arab Sultan and the Sultanate. They didn't, um, they didn't uh, destroy that. They kept it in place, but they, and they ruled through it. So they... Uh, you know, and they had this setup they referred to there and other parts of the world as a, as a protectorate. They sort of were the, were the protectors, but they were the real ruin the throne, mm. if you like. Right. The sun never sets in the British yes. Empire. Well, it did set, and it set in 1960. <laughs> it, it set in 19, Zanzibar, it set in 1963 when the, the, the British handed, uh, the British um, removed themselves as, 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 as the administrators and colonial power and handed power over to, um, you know, back to uh, an elected government. Um, and that government, the party of that government was actually the, the, there was quite a lot of ethnic division in, in Zanzibar at that time. And um, it's generally um, thought that this was fostered by the British themselves, um, who sort of maintained a kind of racial segregation between Arabs and Africans and um, and so on. And um, they handed power over to um, a party that had ostensibly won in, in, the, in, in, in the last elections, which was... Uh, um, as a nationalist, if you like, Arab-dominated party. Um, and so they thought they were doing the island a favour and handing it over to the best the people best suited to rule. Unfortunately, within a month, there was a violent revolution um, and that uh, newly independent government was o overthrown. Um, there was something of a massacre of... Um, of uh, well, we'd now describe it as genocide of uh, Arabs and, uh, and their supporters. Um, some thousands of people were killed in this, this bloody revolution. And from that point on, um, January, 12th of January 1964, and the Zanzibar revolution, it, 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 it became a, a, it was a one-party state, a run-along sort of state. So and that was really, um, in the 60s, uh that was really a time, you know, for the British Empire, you know, where the, the British government was was um, beginning to hand off a, a lot of these um, African um, colonies, uh, you know, back to the people, right? Because they, they did that in Nigeria, I believe, in the 60s as well. Yeah, and of course, decolonization started, you know, right at the end of the Second World War when... when, when um, uh, India was handed back and subdivided and and, uh, and so on, and it, it gathered pace um, through the late 50s and 60s um, until there were relatively few colonies left in Africa. I think the Portuguese were were among the last to 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 um, decolonize. So that's been. I mean, Zanzibar has been um, what it sounds like a, a very volatile uh, uh, melting pot of cultures. Maybe not melting as much as we'd like. Uh, but so well, let's talk about the paranormal aspects and the the socio-religious aspects of the culture that, that led to um, these witch hunts, for example. You know, how do you think the phenomena of the Zanzibar leopard began? Um, I guess we don't really, I mean, we can guess at how it began, but we, we, we can't be certain. Um like um, like Catholicism, in a way, Roman Catholicism, Islam, um, and a lot of varieties of Islam sort of accommodate other sets of ideas and beliefs, sometimes uh, beliefs that you might say or, or suspect are, are, are pre-Islamic, um, and belief in, uh, in spirits and, 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 and things of that nature is an integral part of, of Islam. It's, it's not excluded by Islam. It's, it, it's, it's very much a part of it, a set of beliefs about um, spirits. There is a role for spirits in Islam. Now, 
we don't quite know how we don't have it, it, the documentary records to tell us how um, the Zanzibar leopard got mixed up in the in this. What we do know is that um, in different parts of the world and also um, in uh, in many parts of Africa, animals that are sort of fearsome and predators and are a threat to people. Um, not livelihoods and their lives are a threat to um, people themselves are capable of, of, of harming humans themselves. So if you look at all the big predators, the lions, the leopards, the hyenas, um, even crocodiles um, and um, other, other, other species like that, um, other predators, they tend to attract a sort of a beliefs um, <clears throat> and they often attract beliefs of the kind, well, you know, if, if you're harmed by one of these things or threatened by them, then there must be a reason for it. It's not just happening. Um, and they're scary. And because belief in witchcraft and the occult and things of that nature is, is so widespread and so prevalent uh, in the same way that it was in our own society um, in, in, in the past, um, <clears throat> You know, though, though, those uh, animals of that kind, predators, sort of attract those beliefs uh, quite readily. And, and partly as an explanation for their behavior, an explanation for particular uh, cases when they attack. And, and, and So the idea is, like, if there is a predator attack, something like, you know, the Zanzibar leopard uh, doesn't exist anymore, but it, it wasn't, well, that we know of, but it was native to Tanzania, and it was the smallest of leopards. But still... Uh, it's the kind of it's it's carnivorous. It's the kind of creature that uh, might attack somebody or might attack a kid or something. So I, I think what we're getting to is that when a predator attack happens, and you know we very infrequently have that, but you know the bears can attack people and stuff like that in northern Wisconsin or in Alaska. That that still happens. Wolves can attack people. Um, when that happens, you need to give it some kind of meaning. And so it sounds like you yeah, were attaching the kind of meaning that. Uh, well, it, it can't just be a random thing. Maybe a witch sent the leopard to, to attack, or maybe a witch sent the bear. I mean, I still think witches send bears in Wisconsin. <laughs> well, if you uh, attribute some kind of agency like uh, to it like that, then then you feel like you, you might, in, in some cases, be able to regain some control, whereas if it's just random then it could happen at any time and there's no recourse. Absolutely. And what, when, when we started, I, I, I should say that I, um, you know, I've been researching the Zanzibar leopard since uh, 1996, so just over two decades now. And I've been doing it with a colleague, with an American anthropologist called Hella Goldman. Um, Hella is um, an anthropologist trained in uh, in New York University, and now also did a, a field work and PhD research in in another part of Zanzibar on Pemba Island. Um, we've been working on this this topic together since 1996, um, when we were asked by a conservation organisation, Care, um, or a conservation project, as I say, run by the NGO Care. Um, we were asked to sort of investigate, um, uh, you know, the, the rumours and the stories about the Zanzibar leopard and to to find out basically why uh, why it was threatened, why people were, um, you know, why it seemed that people were quite happy to kill leopards and, and exterminate them. Um, the leopard was real. We know that um, it wasn't just introduced from the mainland. We know from archaeological records that it's... Um, most likely been present on the island since it became an island at the after the end of the last ice age. There are archaeological records of uh, of leopards and uh, other surprising animals as well that it must must have originally been part of its prey, including zebras. There are no zebras anymore in Zanzibar, but you know at one time um, after it had become an island, there was a population of zebras there. Um, <clears throat> so we we've we've got good evidence of the leopard. We've got. Um, We've got six skins in, in, in museum collections. We've only been able to find six. We've seen other parts of skins and other bits of material from leopards, but there are, if you're right, six reasonably complete skins in museums. There are skulls. So we know there were at least six Zanzibar leopards. <laughs> at one time, there were six of them rolling around. Well, we know, that, we know that there were a lot more because we have records of them being killed. So if, 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 if I sort of step back a little, when, 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 we've, when we were first um, 
interviewing people and asking people in the rural uh, villages of Zanzibar about leopards. And we, we started this research in 1996. Um, a lot of people, I mean, the common narrative was that there are two kinds of leopards. We, we asked people about leopards and we, we in particular pursued hunters and others who, who had some knowledge of, of leopards. Not everybody knew a lot about them, but, but people who, who were, were hunters did. And if we asked them about leopards, the, the common narrative was that there are two kinds. People would say, yeah, there are two kinds of leopards. There are the sort of wild ones which are out there in the bush, in the forest, they don't bother you, you, don't, you know, you may be occasionally see them and, you know, they're just living out there, you know, like other wild animals. But there are also um, another class of leopards that are kept, they're kept by people, they're domesticated and they're kept by evil people, by witches, and they're used by those people to do harm to their you know, and harass their, their fellow humans and assert their authority over them and also cause them economic and other kinds of harms. So, you know, he said, well, how do you distinguish between these? Well, and the answer would very commonly come back would be that, well, if you see a leopard out in the middle of nowhere in the forest, that's a wild leopard. If you see one somewhere near, near your field, then that's almost certainly a kept leopard. And that's a leopard that in some senses is kept and controlled by another human being. Um, and usually not kept by a single human being, but so the story goes, kept by a group of uh, evil people, a group of witches who may live they may be met both men and women. They may live in separate villages and they'll share a leopard among themselves and they'll pass it from one to the other. Um, and each will take turns in using the leopard for whatever nefarious purposes they have. And those nefarious purposes would, would very commonly um, be to sort of, you know, scare your neighbours, um, eat their livestock, um, eat their, their goats in particular, um, and chickens or whatever else, sometimes their calves, their cattle, um, and occasionally um, attack and, and, and eat human beings themselves. Now, Martin, real quick, one thing I'm thinking about, did every village have like a, what we would consider, uh, and I know this is the European or white American thing to say, like like a medicine man or a shaman? or So was this in traditional uh, in the culture, would every village have somebody who would perform priestly duties to work with the spirits in the area? Uh, yeah, there are, there are two things to, to distinguish between, um, and they're, they're quite significant. Each, each and, and this, this um, I mean, this is sort of a, 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 a partly a reconstruction of what we know about the past, but, but through to the present, every every. Every village, every settlement, and there may be more than one, and they're in town as well, as well as in the rural areas, is there are um, a group of, 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 we often refer to them as traditional pract practitioners or, or, or doctors. Um, in Swahili, they're called waganga. Um, Mganga. And they're the equivalent of the sort of diviner, the herbalist, the person who diagnoses um, any kind of illness, um, you know, outside of the hospital, there are, of course, clinics and hospitals these days that people go to as well. But they deal with, um, you know, um, if you like, uh, herbal and other kinds of, of traditional um, treatment. They also can diagnose spirits and they can also, and they have different skills. They can also, um, you know, help treat spirit possession in some cases. And, you know, particular, particular practitioners will be specialized maybe in a particular kind of possession or a particular set of illnesses or a particular kind of divination or whatever. So that's one thing. And that's common through to the present. You can, uh, in fact, these days you can sort of sign up as a tourist to, to sort of visit, um, you know, some of these characters who, who've set themselves up, if you like, as tourist attractions. <clears throat> I'm going. Yeah. And there are others who aren't. I mean, but they're, they're widely consulted except during the holy month of Ramadan when it's it's felt it's not appropriate to sort of mix, uh, if you like, high religion with those kind of matters. But the other thing that you alluded to about, you know, other people are and, 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 and control spirits more, more generally is that, yes, that there is, or there used to be. Um, so we know from 
accounts in earlier in the 20th century, in, in the sort of early and mid 20th century, um, we know that a, a, a lot of, uh, a number of villages, so the villages, particularly on the east and south of the island, that still followed a kind of more traditional pattern, if you like, of social organisation. Um, they had um, groups of elders who were in charge of uh, not just um, aspects of the administration of, the, of, of a village, but also its, its, its spiritual welfare. And, you know, sometimes there were also particular individuals who, who, who had, a, had a greater responsibility for those particular matters um, and would have to be consulted if, say, people wanted to go uh, hunting um, in the bush. They would have to first go to, um, if you like, the village. Um, I mean, priest is perhaps too strong a stronger word and one that wasn't, wouldn't be used locally, but people would have to consult with those elders, with those specialists. Um, and, and, and one of, um, um, it's been recorded that one of the reasons they would consult with them would be so that they could avoid any harm from, from leopards. So there was a sense that those elders also in some of the local areas had some degree of um, association over leopards, uh, particularly a set of associations with caves and caves and the spirits in caves. And leopards are often thought to also inhabit caves, and there's a sort of link between. Them. And one thing that, we, going back again, how did these beliefs arise? We, as I say, we're not entirely sure, but we suspect that one way in which they might have arisen is in the sort of shake-up, if you like, of traditional, of the historical social and village organisation. And as those people um, lost their power, uh, the, the, the kind of narrative switched. And the, given that there was nobody anymore, if you like, who was, who was meant to look after these, um, look after leopards in a kind of, or, or, or manage those kind of affairs in a, in a benign and positive way, it sort of just switched into, into, in, into, into this narrative that uh, it's only evil people who are controlling witches. But we're, uh, sorry, controlling leopards. But, but we can't be entirely sure about that. It's just a suspicion. Okay. So I think that's an interesting thing. Alison, you had a question? Yeah. So help us to understand uh, what, what did happen to the leopards and when did it happen? Uh, because they're they're now extinct, as, as far as we know, right? Well, we, we're not entirely sure. Um, there is a possibility, and it might be a small possibility now, but there is a possibility that, that they're they're still alive. So, well, there are some still extant. Um, certainly, there are still reports of them being extant, but not you know, not scientifically verified reports. Right, it's reminding me of the uh, situation in Tasmania with the thylacine, the Tasmanian leopard, or not leopard, uh, <laughs> the, the, the Tasmanian, um, why am I not thinking? <laughs> yeah, the yeah, Tasmanian, Tasmanian tiger. tiger, there you go. Uh, so it, it reminds me of that situation where, you know, there was a economic reason to uh, try to exterminate them, and you know, to this day, and again, they were a predator that was worrisome. And there's economic reasons because of, of livestock, livestock keeping. And, you know, because I think um, at certain points in cultures, uh, people are very close to starvation, perhaps. And so the, the economics of the situation come to the forefront. And, and then they're looking, they're looking for ways to you know, gain power over this overwhelming environment that they're living in, and so one of the common ways is it seems to be is to exterminate whatever populations they think are getting in their way, and you know that that certainly happened with the uh, Tasmanian tiger, uh, and and still to this day, you know, people report seeing the Tasmanian tiger and, and hopefully there are still vestiges of, of the population still there and so I'm excited to hear that you know there might be some uh, extant um, Zanzibar leopards as well. well when you think about it though if you're you know just to put it plainly if you don't have the grocery store to go to and you do your life depends on these chickens or your cows or your livestock that your life depends on it yeah. and a wolf shows up and eats one of your sheep or whatever you're gonna kill that wolf or if you think a wolf's going to come and eat your chickens, you're going to kill that chicken. So 
You know, it's easy to say that like, oh, we would be very enlightened about the whole thing when these guys are thinking, hey, man, I got to feed my family. Right. Um, right. When that wolf shows up, that wolf is going to die. Right. Because it's a preemptive strike. Uh, you know, they feel threatened, perhaps, uh, you know, and on the edge. And, you know, they don't have the, the luxury that, that we have of the grocery store, like you said, Mike. So they have to think of in terms of preemptive strikes. So let's let, let's let Mark, Martin talk, because I know you have a lot more to say. Yeah, that, I, that, I mean that's that's a part of it, and there are there are parallels between the Zanzibar leopard and the Tasmanian tiger, and and um, we've written a, a little about that, and I, I could I could go a bit more into that. But I, I there's also I mean the significant difference. Uh, one of the significant differences is this set of of sort of uh, ideas about you know why why leopards are, are, would attack you or attack your livestock and why they would frighten you. Um, and it's those spiritual beliefs that you, you don't find so much in the in the Tasmanian tiger case, which would, was a more purely sort of economic um, thing. The, um, you know, what happened, and we've got quite, you know, reasonable records, um, you know, after the, let's say, after the First World War and on of, 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 of um of, of, of records of, of, of leopard kills that were, you know, got into the official statistics. And one thing, I mean, one thing that, that we, again, this is, this is, is, is intelligent guesswork, is that as, as agriculture expanded, as population grew, um, you know, agriculture and settlement expanded in, in Zanzibar through the 19th century and into, you know, and that, that sort of continued through the 20th century, then the sort of habitat available to leopards and the prey, of the natural play, prey, sorry, available to them, the, the bush pigs, the monkeys and, uh, and so on that, that were their everyday prey, became harder for them to survive. So it was almost inevitable that people and leopards would 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 come into greater conflict, and and this is a story that that has played out in 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 similar ways in in, in many parts of the world and around many um, protected areas. Now, in the course of as the twentieth century developed, um, what we found, and this is again through interviewing people, in particular, the colonial authorities were were sort of vaguely aware of these beliefs and wrote a little about them, but they, they didn't really understand the sort of full extent of, of, of what, what we people were up to and what was going on. But what we found is, and this, this sort of developed through into the 1950s and the period before the Zanzibar revolution in 1964, is that there were a series of kind of local level efforts to deal with this problem. And those the things that people did varied sort of area by area and village by village. So in some places, um, people who sort of, you know, if they perceived there was a kind of leopard problem, then in some places they would resort to prayer. So they would resort, if you like, to sort of, uh, you know, regular religious means, but they would have special prayers and special uh, uh, religious ceremonies to um, protect themselves and ward off um, that sort of evil and the ill intent of the witches and the, the bad people, if you like, in their midst. And there were different variations upon that kind of response. Another response um, was actually, well, you know, and, it, and it, it's actually quite difficult to deal with witches and, 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 and um, you know, to identify them and, and uh, uh, accuse them and in in zanzibar there's a tendency certainly in in recent times not to take violent action against witches uh, uh, they can be identified through the the practitioners the waganga the traditional doctors that i talked about can help sort of diagnose their existence and can help identify them what so it's thought um but it's much harder to actually take any any action against them and, and the tendency not to take extreme action, which, which happens in other societies. There was not a tradition and a history of witches being killed in, in, in Zanzibar's um, modern history. So it's much easier to kind of kill the leopards. So you think, well, you know, the, there's, there's evil people in our midst, and some of them are well, there are close relatives. There are, are there are grandmothers, our grandfathers, our uncles, our, our, our aunts, our brothers, our sisters. Um, it's a bit tricky to deal with them, but 
but let's just get rid of their leopards and that also uh, right so disempower them by proxy but were there real like were there real groups of people who were thinking that they were doing you know when, when you talk about like, oh there's evil people like a group of witches or something were there actually i'm not saying that the witches actually did stuff but were there actually groups of people who believed that they were performing some kind of magic or anything that this that this belief that they're out there controlling leopards had some relation or was it just a superstition I mean, it, it, it's kind of 50-50. You know, nobody is sort of putting their hands up and saying, hey, I'm a witch. <laughs> um, I, I, as in, you know, European and, and, and North American history, um, you know, people will say all sorts of things when they're deluded or when they're tortured or, 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 or whatever. But it, it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite difficult to... Um, and you could appreciate the reasons why, why people are not putting themselves forward and saying, yes, I'm a, you know, I'm a bad person and I can control leopards and cause harm. There are various reasons, though, why people might, um, why, if you like, the, the you know, it, it, it's not a, not a way in which it's described there, but the sort of, if you like, the white witches, the sort of ritual specialists might claim certain powers um, that are positive um, that are for the welfare and well-being of the community. Um, the traditional doctors, those practitioners, also um, claim certain powers that that um, you know that might lead people then to suspect that they're witches themselves, although they wouldn't want to identify that way. Um, so it, it it's not straightforward, and you can think of circumstances. And I think you know we've probably heard cases of this. It's it's always difficult to know whether to believe what's said about what people said, because a lot of, you know, you're in the territory of gossip and rumour, but um, yeah. it's not inconceivable that some people from time to time would want to sort of boast or brag or frighten um, other people and would claim, you know, the, you know, hint at, they wouldn't say it outright, but might hint, <laughs> hint at the fact that, hey, you know, don't mess with me because, you know, something nasty might happen to you. And, and we do that ourselves so without sort of saying that we're, we're witches or that we've got for us. No, every time, every time somebody comes up to me and wants to start a fight, I just say, <laughs> don't, don't try, man. I'll kill you with my mind bullet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to send my leopard after you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm hoping that being a few thousand miles apart, you know, is going to save me in that respect. <laughs> well, I, what I'm taking away from this conversation is – that, you know, there's so many connections, you know, throughout history, uh, as you were talking about um, in, in European witch lore and in, in uh, North America, uh, you know, I'm just making so many connections. And it's interesting to see, uh, you know, how these commonalities among such disparate cultures. Like, you know, when I'm thinking of I'm thinking of the Bell Witch of Tennessee and how that story came about the, the first the first uh assault that they felt that they experienced from the the bell witch uh the thing that kicked it all off was uh the the family saw uh, this strange creature in in the in the woods uh wolf-like but but they weren't sure and then they attributed it to a, a neighbor that had sent this wolf to terrorize them so but it wasn't quite a wolf so Again, we're seeing that that paranormal aspect, and and we're seeing the idea that you know perhaps you know somebody, uh, a neighbor is um, is going to challenge you in some way economically, and is going to do that through an animal. So that that was um, in the Bell Witch case uh, in Tennessee um, in the the 19th century. Uh, so it makes me makes me think of that, and and um, you know there's certain certainly other parallels as well oh definitely and 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 uh, it, it kind of gets better or worse if you like because um as i say leading up to the sort of early 1960s there were these different sort of localized efforts if you like you know everybody was taking action you know down in their own village um you know they were all dealing with the problem in different ways religious ritual um, or you know, very practical by just trying to kill leopards or trap them. They trap. They both trap them. And they uh, uh, sometimes hunted after them with spears or, or caught them in other ways. And because of the um, because of the sort of uh, associations of, of leopards, the belief that the idea that they were you know kept by evil people 
it was also, I believe, it wasn't just a simple matter to just, you couldn't just sort of kill a leopard. Even coming into contact with a leopard um, was a very dangerous thing to do, to, to touch a leopard, even touching a dead leopard or being involved in, 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 in hunting one or trapping one. You know, you had yourself to be protected by, um, you know, spiritual powers and medicines and so on that maybe a, a um, traditional practitioner could provide you with. So the whole thing was sort of hedged about with danger and taboo, if you like. It wasn't just a sort of straightforward method of um, a straightforward matter or, 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 or killing one with, with a spear or as, as the years went on with a gun. But what happened then after the Zanzibar revolution, after the Zanzibar revolution, which, as I say, was this time of tremendous upheaval. There was a sort of, uh, in effect, a sort of genocide. There was a lot of social disturbance. There was a lot of, if you like, rapid change in the organisation of society and and, and a feeling of, um, you know, a lot of uh, disquiet um, and social turbulence. And as part of that turbulence, and, and this is where, again, there are parallels with the uh, with some aspects of uh, European history, is that this um, these localized effort is sort of you know this localized thing that was going on around leopards, it kind of culminated in a in a in a in a, in a nationwide craze, and it, it it became a nationwide witch hunt. So sometime after the revolution, there was a nationwide you know it was. It, 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 it became a national priority. Uh, it sounds a daft thing today to, to say it wasn't. It wasn't sort of you know documented in, in 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 government policy in any or enunciated in a clear way. But there's a clear sense in which it was. This was supported by the government, um, and there were statements to that effect. But there was there was a drive to to if you like drive out the witches. You know, thinking, well, here's some people who, you know, we've put up with them through the colonial period. <laughs> we've done this and that, you know, but now that we're in control of our own affairs, you know, we've got these pesky people who are interrupting development and getting in the way. You know, let's really, really go for them now. And this happened on both of the two main islands of Zanzibar, on Pemba, where there were no leopards, so they just went for the witches. And... On Anguja, where they had, they did have leopards, and they had, you know, I mean, they had witches who who had nothing to do with leopards, but they also had this category uh, that loomed quite large in many of the rural areas of of witches who were believed to control leopards. So they went for the witches, and if they, over the course of time, a few is a sort of nationwide campaign, and and it's referred to as the Kitanzi campaign because the. Um, the, the, the principal sort of hunter, if you like, of, 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 of witches and then of leopards was uh, a man called Kitanzi, who'd been a, who was already a well-known leopard trapper. And he gathered a group of people around him and they, they led this effort and they were supported and they were subsidized by the government in doing this. So a few people were identified as witches and suffered as a result. Um, there's very little sort of documentation that, that's available about uh, who that happened to and how it happened and what happened ultimately to them. You know, were they released from jail? Did they die? Were, were any of them killed? We're not sure. It's it's it's. It's very murky and it's not being properly researched to date. And we don't know if there are any proper records of it anyway. So was this real quick about this Katanzi guy, though? Was this Katanzi guy like was he making money off leopards already? So you said he was a leopard trapper. Was he like a le like was he selling the skins or something like was what was in it for him to be like, you know, man, uh, we kill these leopards to get back at these witches. It's going to make the whole country safer, and I'm going to make a lot of money. Well, and, and remember, he began this in the in the south of the country, in an area called Makunduchi, before the revolution. So he'd been doing this for some years. And if you were a trapper and an expert trapper, the leopard traps are um, they're quite complex affairs. They're what we call box or, or room traps. They're, they're sort of built with stakes and they have a separate compartment at the end and they have a trap door and some bait at one end or something that can be tripped. And so the leopard's drawn into the, um, into the sort of between the stakes, into the box, if you like, 
um, by whatever bait there is that attracts it. Sometimes a live animal, sometimes a goat or a chicken um, or a bit of meat. And when it gets inside, it, 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 it sort of trips a, a string or wire and that brings down a trapdoor and it's then blocked in and you can sort of spear it. Um, and that was the traditional way of killing them. In, in fact, we have a couple of accounts that the the proper way to do it, and, and this in a way was to sort of guard against the evil eye of the, the leopard, was to sear its eyes with with um, with burning metal, with oh, a, a heated uh, heated spear or iron rod. And it, it, it sounds pretty unpleasant. And to be able to even <laughs> attract attract a leopard to the tree, Trap. So you have to have the skill to build these traps, to locate them, to know how to bait them. But you also had to have the magical powers and the wherewithal to do that and to also sprinkle medicine around that would, you know, supposedly attract the leopard as well in the direction of the trap, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it, it, it was, a, if you like, a, a skill that not many people had. And the people who had those skills, and, we, and this happened through the colonial period it wasn't just uh, Kitanzi wasn't the only one um, <clears throat> is that uh, there were a number of these characters who had those skills and they became quite in demand so they would travel from village they'd be called from village to village you know please you know we've got a we've got a leopard problem at the moment you know oh man yeah here comes the economics right the the Instead of witch finder generals, we have leopard finder generals. Yeah, they would be paid for that. And, uh, and um, yeah, we don't have good records of, of what happens to the skins. Sometimes, I mean, there was, there was a period when the government wanted the skins, uh, but I'm sure there were many cases in which they didn't go to the government. But there was a market for them. So there has been um, over time and certainly into the 1970s and and, and we, we heard rumors even during our research in the 90s of, of skins for sale and people who were trying to sell skins um well i see leopard skin pants all the time are those the zanzibar leopard <laughs> uh, yeah i don't think so mike all right all right if they were we'd be interested <laughs> <laughs> right but the, the Zanzibar leopard is is distinctive. It's a, it's so it, it's been evolving in isolation from other leopards for you know six seven thousand years, you know when Zanzibar became an island, um, and so it's kind of it's it's become smaller in size. It's a smaller leopard than the than most mainland leopards, and in getting smaller, it, it's rosettes. Those sort of distinctive patterns of different coloured spots. It's rosettes have kind of coalesced and become denser so it's 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 got quite a distinctive pattern it doesn't have as the big sort of widely spaced rosettes of many other leopards but they're quite densely packed and so it, it its skin is quite distinctive but there are there are the, the you know tracking them down we don't know where they are i mean we assume a lot of them uh went to the gulf so what happened so after the revolution when 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 you know this this man Kitanzi, who you know, we, we know he had assistants as well, who was who was trapping um, leopards at a, at, a, at a local scale. You know, this became a national campaign, and he developed quite a following around him. And there were other um, characters and relatives and, and, and neighbors of his who became part of his party, and were also given sort of if you like, traditional treatment to protect them against the, the sort of taboo, the evil that, 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 that contact with leopards um, would represent. And they set about on a systematic, you know, once the sort of hoo-ha over witches, and, you know, they did a bit about the witches and then it's very difficult in, 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 to sustain that kind of witch hold, to the say, in, a, in, a, in, in the communities of Zanzibar where there isn't a tradition of killing witches and everybody... Um, you know, assumes that various members of the family are, are, are witches anyway. So, you know, it wouldn't do to just go about killing them all. Um, so once the attention then sort of shifted to leopards, then the the, the anti-witchcraft campaign became an anti-leopard campaign. And it was led by this man, Kitanzi, and, and his uh, coterie and a number of people around him who, who were also specialised hunters and trappers, and by this time also using guns, um, to kill the leopards, and they set and they were subsidised and helped by the government. So they were 
you know, they were they, they the hunters, the people who were hunting leopards were, were actually assisted, and they were doing this and killing leopards at a great rate for a, for a number of years, as far as we know, certainly into the 1970s. And um, we know from uh, an, the account of an American consul at one point that the leopard skins were being handed over to the police and the authorities, and they were being taken to a leather factory in Zanzibar, where they were being prepared for export. Now, I don't have, and I haven't seen records of what happened to them after that, but um, I, 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 my guess is that when they got to their destinations in the Gulf or wherever, they weren't distinguished from other types of uh, leopard skins. So, you know, people might have, uh, you know, um, objects in their possession that are, are, are made from Zanzibar leopard skins, but but they wouldn't know, and and we wouldn't know without any any documentation or some kind of DNA testing. So, what was the year um, that they probably went extinct? Uh, you know, we're hoping hoping there's still a vestige po- population, but, but what was the year that that we think we might have lost the, the Zanzibar leopard? So we can put it in context. Yeah, let, let me bring this story then up to date. So, you know, the Kitanzi campaign runs into, uh, you know, somewhere in the 1970s, the early to mid 1970s, and then, um, you know, he 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 didn't he didn't he he didn't live for much longer, um, and it kind of morphed into a more general thing that, um, as again a drive for sort of improving agriculture agricultural production under the sort of state socialist system, um, hunting of various animals that were classified as vermin. So they were, a, you know, a threat to sort of crop production, bush pigs, um, colobus and, um, and blue monkeys and, 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 and various other animals were, were sort of, it was accepted that they could be hunted. And in fact, the government subsidised um, a, a national association of hunters they actually subsidized them and paid their petrol and gave them free bullets and other stuff to sort of encourage them to blast as many animals as possible um, in the category of vermin and leopards were included in that category so from the 19 from some point in the 1970s i think it is on to the mid 1990s when we began work there are official statistics you know we killed so many pythons we killed so many monkeys we killed so many bush pigs we killed this and that and we killed so many leopards so we've actually got statistics um how whether they were people were over claiming whether there would be an advantage to doing that or we or whether these statistics are just the tip of the iceberg we don't know but we have a we have at least some record that, that leopards were being killed, uh, you know, with a fi- an officially in an officially sanctioned way, um, through to I think it's 1995 when we have the the last certain record. Now, what was starting to happen then is that in the early 1990s, kind of um, the sort of delayed effect that Zanzibar had this sort of state socialist system and. On that, you know, it, 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 like a lot of those systems, it, it, it wasn't working out economically. It started to fail in various ways. And this, this happened at an earlier stage, if you like, on the Tanzanian mainland. Um, and the country started to liberalise, still ruled by the same single party, but the economy started to liberalise. And as part of that process and later than a lot of other places and later than mainland Tanzania and, and Kenya and other places in East Africa, sort of conservation came to Zanzibar. And it, it came through, um, you know, the interest of uh, international donors and um, non-government organisations like CARE, which set up um, this conservation project, the Jazani Tracker Bay Conservation Project, which, which actually led ultimately to the formation of, of, um, of Zanzibar's first sort of properly gazetted national park. So in the 1990s, there was suddenly this interest, and it, it, I say it was brought by um, a lot of um, external conservationists, but also Tanzanians who've been trained in conservation and uh, wildlife on the mainland and in the University of Dar es Salaam. There's suddenly an interest in, 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 in the animals of Zanzibar, including the Zanzibar leopard. Um, and so this is when people start saying, well, you know, what are these stories about it being 
um, you know, leopards being being kept by people. Um, is it true? You know, it seems everybody says that it's true. Well, how do they do it? What's what's the truth behind that? And um, are there any leopards left? You know, are they are they are they still around? Who 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 last saw them? What evidence do we have for their continued existence? And it was at that point, 1996 that we began to do our research. But it was also at that point that those records of leopard, the official records of leopard killing stop. Um, and it maybe they stopped because there was some sensitivity then over, well, maybe we should be conserving leopards rather than right. killing them. It wasn't cool to kill leopards anymore. It wasn't cool. And when we did our research in 1996, I mean, we heard a number, I mean, we were hearing for, for some years after that rumors of leopards being seen and you, you can still um, hear those rumors that, that you know you, we still get stories of leopards um, being seen or killed and these are the ones who actually are being kept by the witches right well it, well it, who knows uh, it, you know it, it's getting very murky but there's no there's been let's put it this way there's actually been no i mean Zanzibaris themselves are probably at a declining rate, uh, sort of anecdotally, um, are reporting seeing leopards or think they've seen leopards or it might have been a leopard or, you know, they saw a leopard eating a monkey up a tree or, you know, one sort of ran past across the road or they, um, you know, there's something, you know, we've got photographs of livestock of goats that have been, you know, chewed up and uh, there's not many things that can chew goats in, in quite the way that... Um, as, as, as happened in these photographs, which were taken just a couple, two or three years ago. Um, we've got sort of possible footprints, but you can never quite be sure with footprints. The last, the only research, the last researchers to actually say that they saw leopards was, was in the, the 1980s, a couple of Tanzanian researchers. Um, and no, no, no other researcher since then claims to have seen a leopard. Um, and since the 1990s, uh, zoologists and conservationists uh, uh, from afar have been um, assuming that the Zanzibar leopard is extinct. Um, there are one or two zoologists who think it's possible and think that there is enough prey for them still, in a, enough for them still to eat, if you like, and, and enough habitat for them to exist in, who think it's possible that there could still be um, leopards. So it's, uh, there's, there's still a bit un of uncertainty. It's, I mean, it, it's like the Tanzan Tasmanian tiger. There's, there's no, it's easier to demonstrate that an animal exists than to demonstrate that it doesn't exist. Right. And, and so when's the last time that you went over there to actually be like, okay, like investigate reports of the leopard? Yeah, I, well, I, I've been going, um, you know, every year or two years in, 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 in over the past decade or so. And, um, yeah, sometimes more regularly because um, I lived in uh, Tanzania until uh, 2003. Um, so I was visiting Zanzibar regularly. And then since then, since returning to the UK, I've, um, you know, if I can't go every year, and sometimes I've been more than once a year, I go um, every, every, every couple of years. Um, and doing doing various things, not always uh, doing intensive research, but just sort of catching up on what the latest uh, stories were. Uh, you know, what are people saying now? Uh, working with people in the in in the sort of conservation authority in the parks, uh, working with some local informants. Um, one thing I did, and I started doing in in two thousand is eleven, is that I. Uh, I found one file, a wonderfully thick file, that was dedicated to a particular case in 1948. And there was a leopard that loosely described as a, as a man-eater, the man-eater of Uroa, which was a, a village, is a village on the east coast of Zanzibar. And that was 1948. It, it's well documented that it killed four people, or that leopards uh, killed four people. Uh, one adult woman, one elderly woman, and uh, three children, one of whom was a, a small infant. And they were all killed. And this, this seems to have happened uh, on other occasions as well. They were all killed um, while guarding their, their agricultural fields out, out in the bush. So not in the village centre. They were killed out, out in their fields because at certain times of year you have to guard the fields against 
bush pigs and birds and, and other stuff that's, that's trying to eat your millet or whatever or the grain you're growing. Um, and they were killed over a period of a few weeks in 1948. And there's a lot of excitement about this. The colonial authorities were quite disturbed by this and, and took various actions, you know, and said, you know, we're quite worried about the effect this would have on the local population. Again, there was a lot of sort of uh, political and social turbulence in, in going on in Zanzibar town at that time. So there's a lot of concern over, you know, how this might spill over if, it, if the sort of panic developed. So the authorities themselves, in a way, panicked. Um, and they wrote a lot about this until they'd satisfied themselves that, that, that they, you know, and they invested uh, time and effort into, in, into sort of tracking down what they thought was the leopard responsible to this, for this. But because it was 1948, I, I read these files and they're wonderfully detailed. They include, you know, a couple of autopsy, of, of gruesome autopsy reports as well of, of two of the victims. But I thought, hold on, 1948. Um, you know, what are the chances that there are some people who might remember those events? So um, when I next went to Zanzibar, I went out to um, the villages concerned, Uroa and other villages on the East Coast, and sort of started to seek out people who were old enough to remember those events or remember sure. something or know something of those events. And I, I did that. That, that. that was the focus of my research over, over, over a few years was... Um, was uh, um, tracking down those people and recording them and recording their accounts. And what I got, of course, was a completely different perspective, is that whereas the colonial authorities had decided on the model of the, you know, various famous cases of man-eating leopards and tigers in India, and then also the man-eating lions of Savo in what is now Kenya, they sort of constructed this is a man-eater. There was a man-eating leopard. It was based around a particular village, and it was responsible for these deaths. If you sort of, uh, you know, ask local people what they thought about it um, and what they remembered of it, first of all, they remembered uh, many more incidents. So not just the, the killings, but also they remembered other incidents of, of people being attacked and and and. Um, and harmed or frightened by leopards at that time, it, it was it was quite a serious problem. In fact, we realised that some years before, in 1996, my colleague Heller had, had, had interviewed somebody who had been attacked by a leopard at that time when he was a, when he was a young boy, and um, when he was a sort of infant, and he, he still had the scars, and we've got photographs of, of the scars on his body, on his on his knees, uh, in particular from that uh, from when he was attacked. So when you think about that, I mean, about the leopards there, like people had like a Moby Dick moment. They have this memory of leopard killing four people in 1948. They have memories of leopards attacking, you know, people they know and stuff. So when we think about like, oh, well, we're not going to, we wouldn't kill leopards or let's save the leopards and stuff. These people had a very real experience, a very real memory of let's take, you know, like it, when you think about sharks and stuff, you're like, well... Mm. If we'd kill all the sharks around, you know, swimming beaches, people would be like, well, yeah, of course you're going to do that. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's visceral. I mean, it, 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 you know, it, it, they were the subject of fear, really afraid of, of these animals. And they were afraid not just of them as, as predators, but afraid because they weren't just ordinary predators. But as, as, as they saw it, they were backed up by, you know, as, you know, very powerful and evil forces that um, were quite difficult to resist, you know, without sort of uh, deploying sort of religious and ritual and magical means yourself. Um, what was interesting was that, um, in, you know, the local memory of these events was, was, was no idea at all that this was the work of a single man-eating leopard, but each each set of incidents in each uh, village in each local area had its own explanation, you know, in terms of, of, of you know, which uh, witch or group of witches or who, you know, who was responsible for the attacks in that particular place. There was no idea of a sort of overview of these things and that they were all the work of a single man eater. And we we simply don't know. They might have it might have been they might have been the work of of, of, of different leopards. We or, or a single leopard. We we have no way of knowing. Well, Martin, one last question for you. Where do we think 
uh, the situation with the Zanzibar leopard rests today. I mean, you seem to be, when I was doing research on this, I was looking and it's always, somebody's always quoting you uh, as you are the expert on the Zanzibar leopard. And where do you think the situation is today? Like if it was reintroduced or people found it and tried to maybe bring the leopard population back, let's say there's a few left, do you think they would run into the same issues that they had in the past? Uh, it, 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 it's a tricky one, and I, I should bring my um, my colleague Hella Goldman into this as well, because we we just spent the um, we just spent a few weeks in in September working with um, a film crew from uh, Los Angeles who, uh, who are making a a, a a a documentary on the on uh, for Animal Planet and a series called Extinct or Alive. So they 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 they've been filming for a documentary about the leopard. So. He kind of brought us together, if you like, uh, helping them. We were doing some camera trapping of, 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 of other animals for them. But it sort of brought us back together to do research at the same time. And also to sort of think through some of these issues and, and see what the current status is. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's a game. We, we are sort of, is, is, is um, you know, to get, get evidence. Um, and I guess this is the problem. This is, I mean, it, it, no different in a way from the the, the, the the sort of task of many paranormal investigators, um, although we wouldn't think of it in those terms. Uh, um, you know, we're still interested in everything really like, I mean, the best evidence is, is DNA. And we still don't have a DNA profile of, we've been trying to get one, but we haven't got one yet, of, of the Zanzibar leopard. And, and it should be possible to get one from the skins or some of the skins that... Um, you know, exist in museums, and we we we've, we've tried to organise that, but it hasn't happened yet. But hopefully, in the in the near future, it will, because only through that kind of through very, um, I guess, if if you get a sort of proper visual record, a photograph um, that has proper providence provenance, you know where the photograph was taken, you know that it's not being tampered with. Um, there's no possibility that this is a leopard that somebody has brought from the mainland or somewhere else. You, you can be almost certain because of um, you know its its features, the pattern on its coat that I mentioned um, that that is a Zanzibar leopard. Or you have other other evidence such as um, leopard poop or scat or fur or you know a skin. Um, that's more recent and that you can test for DNA and then compare it with the, the DNA of those specimens. So one of our interests has is, is, is been in, 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 getting, in getting that kind of evidence, um, just to know how was the, the Zanzibar leopard related to mainland leopards and to have a standard, if you like, against which any, any possible subsequent find can be measured. Um, do we hold out hope? I think it, it's in human nature to always um, think that, yes, it's possible. Um, maybe there's one or two out there. If there are, though, um, and I think this would be a, a, a quite general feeling among those who were, were, you know, held out some hope and others are much more sceptical. But even if there, there are leopards, it, it sort of prospects. Um, surely are not uh, are perhaps not very great. Some parts of Zanzibar are better protected than they used to be. There, there is a park and there are, there's stronger protection from some areas, but population continues to grow. Um, the threats to the leopard haven't diminished in the sense that it, its prey, the animals that leopards themselves might prey on, has, have, have also declined quite drastically. Some of them are even, you know, are still being hunted and hunting of them is allowed. So it, it will be difficult to be kind of feel positive um, about those prospects, even if there were one or two leopards around. So you didn't like grab one. It's not you. You didn't like have a couple of Zanzibar leopards in your basement or anything like that. You're like, oh, I'll just I'll just breed them myself. <laughs> a breeding pair yeah. in your basement. <laughs> we we we've, we've spoken to a number of people and heard of all you know a lot of cases of people who who claim that they do have <laughs> sure. or that they know where one is. And, and we we've um, you know we've been over the years we've been through a whole series of what we call. Um, imaginary leopard chases i mean think of wild goose chases but these are these are these are imaginary leopards because um 
And we've done this a number of times and we did it in the summer. We followed up on um, a couple of uh, men, one of them who worked in the national park, um, who claimed that they'd seen a leopard and its cubs, uh, one or more cubs, um, just the month before. And we followed up on that story. We set up our camera traps and, you know, as you might expect, got zilch. Right. Bigfoot never showed up. Yeah. And if you follow up on kept leopards, I mean, on the stories, you know, my uncle, he's got a leopard under the bed. We can show you, blah, blah, blah. It's <laughs> become, <laughs> it, it, I mean, and again, this doesn't happen with the Tasmanian tiger. It's also become a kind of, uh, uh, you know, a thing of value, a monetary thing. So w- we've had emails, um, you know, sort of saying, you know, we can we can show you leopards, um, just hand over, you know, a few million um, dollars or shillings or, or or whatever it is, and we we we've, we and others have, have sort of you know tried to tease out some of those cases. We 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 um you know and and, and again they never quite get anywhere. They never quite pan out. You know the, and yeah. and a lot of other people who are less skeptical than us have uh, you know have gone on these chases and you know they've been taken to places and caves and whatever, but they've never quite got to the point where they're able to see the leopard or get any you know a piece of the leopard or a bit of fur or a photograph or anything so um you know we 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 have to remain skeptical but there's been some some great stories along the way including um one of our good friends who is now the um, chief warden of the national park of jizani national park a few years ago he he went on one of these chases um, where a number of people were in contact with him by phone saying they had a couple of leopards for sale and he said let's see them and they sort of chased around on mopeds and in the end he persuaded two of them to come to his office with the leopard cubs and they appeared in his office with a box and they opened the box, and there were the leopard cubs, but those leopard cubs looked mightily like two ordinary kittens. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> and they didn't look very like leopard cubs, so he was rather suspicious. What? He oh, took man. Fo- to his credit, he took photographs, he sent them packing, he said, I'm not quite sure about this. He, he, he let them go with their, their supposed cubs. Um, he got somebody else. He got a hunter, actually, a, a European hunter in to, um, with hunting experience to look at them. Um, that guy said these are either kittens or they're African wildcats. We were the, if you like, the, the, um, the, the wild animals that, that are domesticated cats are descended from. Um, right. Quite difficult to tell apart. We've shown the photographs to African wildcat experts and um the conclusion is that these were a couple of nice little sort of uh, tabbies, um, little domesticated kittens. Well, I think that's I think that's so, a great so place what, to what? Uh, to let everybody know. Um, you know, on a, on a closing note, everybody, if you're looking to make some money, find <laughs> the Zanzibar leopard and can call Martin and be like, I've got him. I've got the cubs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can make a. a- a drop. Yeah, and if you do that, don't try and cheat us. You know, don't <laughs> don't bring cubs from somewhere else. You know, right. don't just bring your, cat, your cats from home and be like, I found it. Don't bring leopard cubs from you know from a park in in mainland Tanzania, or we'll we'll yeah. find you out. And, you know, <laughs> I I just wanted to um, finish on that note. Uh, you know, you're, you're you're helping us to see the the unique uh, struggles and challenges that that researchers come up against in the field. You know, as you said, uh, these are the same challenges that are faced, you know, by by cryptozoologists, uh, by paranormal investigators as well. Uh, you know, getting all of these uh, eyewitness accounts and, you know, trying to suss them out, trying to find the ones that have the most authenticity. And, um, you know, I just wanted to get your perspective on, you know, I, I've been uh, – Many people know I've been hunting uh, the Chicago Mothman uh, because there's been uh, 58 uh, different uh, reports um, over the last year. And uh, so I've been tracking each of those cases down. And uh, and I'm finding it a, a very interesting in terms of a social phenomena. But, but I wanted to ask you uh, on a final note um, – what what do you think is beyond behind some of these claims? I mean, surely it's economic in, in some some situations. And that last one sounded like, well, maybe it, it was just a misidentification. 
But give us you know, a little insight into social phenomena like this. You know, are people misidentifying? Are they wanting to believe? I mean, what, what are the reasons for all these reports? I think there's no simple answer. I think I think it's a mixture of things. Um, you know, and the, there, are, as you know, there are you know cryptids are cryptids aren't all the same. They they fall into different categories as well. The um, the Zanzibar leopard and the Tasmanian tiger. We 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 know were in inverted commas real animals. There's um, you know, there's there's documented evidence that um, they existed. Um, <clears throat> In the case of the Tasmanian tiger, um, stretching back, you know, now for for, for decades, but um, you know, in those cases, the the standard of proof and evidence is is, is maybe different, and we've got different things to work on. Um, and there is a possibility; there always has to be a possibility that uh, they may have survived, however remote it is, in cases when there's been no Harvard evidence for years and years. But Something like the Mothman, um, yeah, that's 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 a different kind of cryptid in in the yeah. sense that there's you know you don't have a type specimen in a museum. Um, you well, know, not you yet, Martin. Those. I'm working on it. <laughs> not yet. Well, if you get it, you know, we'll, <laughs> we'll, you know, we'll, we'll all be going there. Um, <laughs> But it, it's it's. But I think yeah, the same factors of, of if you like psychology and um, you know the similar types of social factors operate across all of these cases. And and there's, there's different reasons, and it, it changes. You know, in some cases we know some of the cryptids um, or some of the Mothman equivalents, or like even the sort of Popo Bauer that. Um, um, we talked about in, in, in an earlier podcast, uh, Zanzibar Popo Bauer, um, the sort of batwing, uh, evil, whatever, right. um, flying phenomenon. Yeah, so, so there's similarities in from the Popo Bawa, uh, the Popo Bawa and the Mothman, but it's different than uh, the Zanzibar leopard or the Tasmanian tiger because, you know, we don't know that, that these – uh, existed. These are, are seem to be more the the creatures of nightmares, whereas the Zanzibar uh, leopard and the uh, Tanzanian tiger, you know, they became creatures of nightmares. I mean, they were actual animals, but you know, they they kind of bridged that gap in, into nightmare. Um, so so we're talking about nightmares, <laughs> you know, uh, but, you know, some with with more uh, documentation, you know, that they really existed and, and some that might be completely in the imagination. And what I was going to say is that, you know, but the same psychology operates. I mean, and we all misidentify. We can all see things uh, going bump in the night. Um you know, and there are sometimes good explanations for that, and sometimes we don't have explanations for that, and and those things are still open to, uh, you know, query and investigation, depending on your sort of philosophical uh, standpoint. But um, <clears throat> yeah, it it's 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 um, yeah, the 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 human capacity to um, you know misidentify and see and imagine and create is certainly going to be a part of this. And there are, again, different reasons for that. Some um, some which are physiological, some which are, are not. Um, but I think every case is different and every case has to be taken on its own merits. So I think it's quite difficult to generalize across all sort of cryptids and, and, and things of that nature to, um, you know, a single set of explanations. But don't blame a girl for trying. <laughs> <laughs> We want to thank you very much for hanging out with us today, Martin. Well, once again, we want to thank Dr. Martin Walsh and Allison from Milwaukee Ghosts because uh, it's to me it's really a fascinating subject because he's actually getting hired by a non-governmental organization, an NGO, like a like an international fund to go find this leopard that was made extinct in the past couple of decades because people believe in witches. Yeah, and that's got to be such an exciting project to be part of, you know? Yeah. Well, and he gets to be on the travel channel and stuff. And I'll right. That too. right, that's cool. And he gets to go to Zanzibar, and I want to go to Zanzibar. But it's knowing that, you know, there is the possibility that you could discover something that is thought to be extinct. Right, and being part of it. And the exci- so, very uh, cool. 
make sure you check out the show notes because we got pictures of Martin, pictures of the, the kittens and stuff that he had sent um, and everything right there. And we just want to thank him for his time again because yes. uh, he's a fascinating, educated guy who like does lectures and stuff. And then he also takes time to talk to us. And we just like talking about weird stuff. So we appreciate <laughs> him coming down to our level and talking about weird stuff. Now, um, Allison, the last time Martin was on, we wanted to talk about the leopards, but we didn't get a chance because we were too into the Pope Bawa. Yes. And she wrote a poem inspired by that conversation with Martin, and it's called Imaginary Animals. And you can also find that at the show notes. Very uh, cool. And, and you can check out Allison's poem about imaginary a- animals. And you got to love it when the paranormal inspires you to create art like that. It does. And, and well, and the conversation with Martin uh, this week also inspired us to write a song uh, about the Zanzibar leopard, or at least uh, inspired by their quest to like destroy the leopard. Uh, it just made <laughs> oh. me, you know, it really made me think of Captain Ahab and Moby Dick. Ah, and, yes. And so, you know, when you're so obsessed with something, um, sometimes when it's good, sometimes when it's bad, it, you can dig yourself into a real hole, uh, a Captain Ahab esque kind of hole. And that's what we talk about in this song, Sunspot, with Chasing Devils. You dreamed of risk You dreamed of chasing devil's dust to dawn And waiting for their kiss You wish for abuse Hoped for neglect Wishing for an oppressor you could fight And a cause you could insurrect You want to for listening to today's episode. You can find us online at othersidepodcast.com. Until next time, see you on the other side. We got to see Ned this weekend. We did. We got to see the good doctor at Boo Fest this weekend, and we had a great great time. And so I uh, had a good party with Ned. Ned actually just sent me an article that, we, that might inspire a future podcast as well. And so he sent an article about ghost photography when we talk about the podcast. Now, the thing is, if you guys are interested in suggesting topics for the podcast or contributing or sending in articles that we talk about, um, make sure you check out othersidepodcast.com slash donate. That's our Patreon community. And we just had a Patreon hangout this week, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, the Halloween one, and we were all uh, costumed up for it. Yes. Now, I didn't... I didn't wear a total. Co- I just wore a They Live T-shirt, but I thought that was good enough. But Wendy had on the witch's outfit. Um, <laughs> what was Scott wearing? He had the devil horns and cape. Right. Scott, and he's uh, he had the hot cape on. I remember.
Yes, and uh, John had the fez. Yeah, and and we just had a lot of fun talking <laughs> with our Patreon communities about. I, I think most of it was about horror movies, but we did get to some paranormal stuff as well, and all the you know everybody's sharing the paranormal places they've been, the stories they've heard, and just ex- different experiences, and it's a lot of fun. And I, I look it, forward to those hangouts. I do too. I really think it's a nice time to uh, drink some wine and tell some jokes. And we would like to hang out with you, and you can do that to become part of our Patreon community. You can check that out at othersidepodcast.com slash donate, and we'd love to see you there. Did, did we miss anything? Um, I don't think so. I think we got it.